nice to meet you. Oh, yeah, that's better. Cool. There you go. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, what do you want to talk about today? Well, uh, my first question kind of sets us on a track, and, and we kind of go from there. It's, it's quite philosophical. Um, Good. Awesome. Good. I'm, I'm glad you're into that. Um, I'll let you get that. Uh, cool. Yeah, I think we're set up. Oh. Perfect. How would you describe the state of the world today? I'd say we're in a fairly significant crisis. I think the crisis, I used to think it was a, a largely an environmental crisis, although more recently I think we would be disingenuous if we didn't point out that it's just pure, quite uh, uh, simply a, a global crisis, maybe plural, I mean, I think we not only have the obvious environmental issues with the looming climate crises we're facing, I think that really when you start looking at the major institutions that humanity has sunk incredible amounts of resources into, um, I am of the opinion that almost every one of those institutions experiencing um, major convulsions today. I don't care if we're talking about governance systems, uh, economic systems, education systems, uh, uh, what I would consider maybe tra traditional sort of religious institutions and faiths. So I, I think we really are living in, in an age here where really the range of the kinds of our problems we're facing are uh, um, uh, so daunting at one level that I think it does engender often in people a sort of uh, fatalism, and I think that's that's one of the things we really have to be able to articulate an alternative to a fatalistic view, because um, there are people who will say, "Yeah, you're right. Oh my God, what what can we do? You know, there's there, there's nothing we can do," and I I reject that. So where does this start? I mean, are we an inherently conflicted species? I mean, I don't know about uh, indigenous cultures. I mean, the Western narrative, the, the three-act play, the Western narrative is, is that you have the hero, you have conflict, and then you, sol you solve the problem. I mean, even Darwinism refers to competition as, as, and the survival of the fittest in order to evolve. Um, mm. What do you see as the, the human being? What, what is the human being? What, what, what drives us? Well, I think, again, now I'm going to speak from an indigenous perspective. I am a Zoya Ha, a, a Yuchi Ha, a member of the Muscogee Nation. Um, uh, we're a small people who were removed on the Trail of Tears uh, to eastern Oklahoma, along with uh, uh, the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, the Seminole, the Cherokee, and then our, our Muscogee, or Creek relative. But um, I've been here at Haskell Indian Nations University for 30 years, and I've sort of formulated some, some principles that I think are widely shared, at least in North America, the contiguous native peoples whose homelands are within the contiguous 48 states and Alaska, and recently as I've talked to you know, uh, Pacific Islanders, it sounds like we are all sort of share a very common worldview. And, and I would suggest to you that, that the narrative that sort of uh, brings many of us together is first and foremost a decided rejection of anthropocentric views of creation. That, that uh, it's I cannot find a single, I have not been able to find any native tradition that gives man such a central, uh, controlling, dominating, exploitative role as that which we find in the Western tradition. And I think, so, the, the first thing is that I would reject the issue, I, I don't like neoconservatism, I don't like uh, uh, social Darwinism, I reject uh, even certain, you know, uh, laissez-faire kind of notions of, 
uh, Homo economicus because I think that really all beginning with this assumption that somehow it's human nature, uh, um, you know, to be competitive, to be um, uh, destructive, to be engaged in, in um, really, I think, um, very, you know, um, um, devastating kinds of behaviors, not only with human, other human beings, but with the rest of the life on the planet. And I actually, I, I'm willing to say, I see that largely absent within indigenous worldviews. So that, that sort of stepping back from anthropocentric notions of creation. Um, I always like to share with students the quote that uh, I, I've taken from uh, Dr. Henrietta Mann, a, a Cheyenne elder, and, you know, she says, even when we think of religion, uh, for within indigenous traditions, religion isn't something you go searching for. We don't have Indians looking around to find their spirituality. We begin with the premise that we are spiritual beings before we're ever born, and we take this life to become human beings. Now, we, we actually problematize that. Our life in, in many indigenous traditions is a search about this question, what does it mean to be a competent human being? And if you begin with this decided rejection of anthropocentrism, it leads you then to think, well, I've got to look to relationships, to relatives, to processes in order to understand life. And I think that's precisely where indigenous traditions hold great hope if we can begin a dialogue about that kind of wisdom. So, so what's your understanding of, of the concept of, of, a, of, a, of God? Or, or would you say that there is a grand design, a, a universal intelligence? Yeah, I, I, you know, I think God is, is really... A, a term that is 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 so problematic. It's sort of like when you talk about government and people want to automatically talk about the state. Well, I think God, the notion of God, is burdened with with you know basically at this point God singular. This kind of the the great really legacy of monotheistic traditions. Um, I think you know this is something where you would be hard-pressed, um, the Osage theologian uh, 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 George Tinker, uh, Tink is what people call him, Tink Tinker, even says he doesn't believe in God. He, there is no God. And he, of course he's playing rhetorically off this kind of Judeo-Christian notion of what God is. But I think what you can find is that in many native traditions, there's this notion that um, a creator that might be as creative force, as power, that we are actively engaged in in the universe. And it, it sort of, it, one way of sort of maybe comparing it is to say some people who would go looking for God in native traditions, and again, I'm making a generalization here. I'm not saying this applies to all native people, but I think in many of our traditions, we would say the sacred surrounds us. We are embedded in that. That's why I think this notion of fundamentally a spiritual cosmos, a spiritual universe, really problematizes this notion that we have to look somewhere else to find God. No, he's right here, he's right now. So she is, it is, that power, that force is. What would you say the human being's role is within that force? Are we that force living this out? Are we well, we're a part of it, but the problem is, the problem is, uh, human beings seem to think that they've got uh, the right to be in charge. And I think, again, this gets into complicated worldviews here now. So, um, I, you know, just as a way of starting the discussion, I'd say that it makes a big difference 
If you look at the balance of creation, the life we share this planet with, remember what I said about this rejection of anthropocentrism. When we begin in that anthropocentric tradition to think of all of that life as resources, it's interesting that we de facto sort of acknowledge these as, we've taken it for granted. No one ever asks, well, resources for whom? That's a solution for humans. The scientific view of nature and an Onondaga view would be that scientists want to always come and talk to us about our resources. He says, we have no word for resources. When you talk about the water, when you talk about the land, when you talk about the trees, he said, in our language, you are talking about relatives. You think about a radical paradigm shift, imagine how different our practical everyday lives would be if we said, I am going to try to conduct myself today as a good relative to the balance of creation I share this planet with. That to me is, is a, a fundamentally radical and a very indigenous notion. How do you arrive at that perspective? How does somebody arrive there? Well, I think that there's hope. I think the, the, the way you arrive at it is, and, and you know this, um, if you start looking at the whole discussion now that um, is really happening among scientists, physical scientists. I mean, we're, we're talking about the people who are the opposite of, of tree huggers and, and, and you know, the stereotypical notion of close to nature, Mother Earth types. When you start looking at their studies about what's happening in the oceans, what's happening with the forest, what's happening with our air quality, what's happening with the radical decline of biodiversity, they are problematizing this notion of what it means to live and what now some of them are denominating the Anthropocene, that human-centered world. And I think they're struggling, struggling mightily to find an alternative to that human-centered view of civilization, of progress. And I think there's where we need to listen very carefully to indigenous thinkers because I think although people, people may initially find it very difficult to understand what that means in a practical sense, I think people are very open now to saying, well, you know, man, what we've been trying hasn't worked very well. We need to try something else. And so I think there is an opportunity, and I see many scientists now sort of arriving at that position of, you know, wow, maybe we need to think about, you know, the planet, our relationship to it in very different ways. So I think there's some hope there. So I, I, I guess the point of the matter is if anyone is paying attention, this may, our biggest challenge may be, we have large number, numbers of people on the planet who don't seem to be paying any attention at all. But for those who are across the whole spectrum of science, across the whole spectrum of, of, of uh, religious or, or, or spirit, spiritual communities, those who are paying attention are all pretty much in an agreement about what they're seeing. We can describe it. We can acknowledge it. And now the question is, how are we going to address it? And so I think, I think the biggest challenge will be to get the large numbers of people who simply aren't paying attention to pay attention. And unfortunately, their, their attention will be captured uh, later. And for some of them, when that happens, I'm afraid it, it's going to be a very, very serious wake-up call. The, the, the real challenge is to get to people and get them to thinking about what we can do now so that in some ways we can mitigate or avoid some of the most damaging things that we're setting in motion, have already set in motion, but still have it within our ability. We can, we can keep doing the same old thing and make it a whole lot worse, or 
we can try to minimize the damage that's already on its way to us because of the large earth systems and the consequences that sometimes it will take us uh, three, four, five, possibly even a decade to see the full manifestation of those. Well, you know, I've spoken to uh, climate scientists and, 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 and many are suggesting that it's already too late in many ways. We're already going to lose 40% of species, 40 to 50% of species. The earth is going to warm. There's going to be climate mass climate migrations. Um, it seems like technology is, is going full steam ahead, so we're projecting our realities into boxes and out, outside of ourselves, rather than, as you were suggesting, perhaps, mm -hmm. going inward to find that, that, um, that relationship with whatever you want to call it, whether it's a, a god or a divine force that we all have. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you see this all playing out? I mean, how is... Well, I, 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 I do think we're, we're at a tipping point. Now, here's the, here's the point. You notice what I the way I've shaped this. So here's here's the good news and the bad news. Bad news is we are in one heck of, of a jam right now. Now, uh, the good news is it's not a function of human nature. It's a function of particular human cultures. So I always tell my students there's this quote, you know, that's often circulated, Einstein's reported to have told a colleague, you know, you can't solve a problem with the same kind of thinking that created it. So I'm always telling my Lakota, my Diné, my Nishnabe, my Seminole, you know, my, my Passamaquoddy students, I'm saying, Passamaquoddy ideas, notions of, of uh, how we ought to live on the planet didn't create this mess. We can't blame Diné philosophy. We can't blame Diné spiritual traditions. Maybe what we need to do now is to listen very seriously to people who have maintained long-standing relationships to particular places on the planet in a very tactile, physical, a very profound, spiritual manner, and built social and cultural institutions that, res that, that are the embodiment of a symbiotic relationship between the man and their environment. Maybe it's time to, to listen to those voices about what we might do to live better. I, I, I agree that, that, you know, things are going get are, are going to get bad. I happen to believe, though, that that there is, uh, you know, for as far as I can see, I mean, there's 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 bad and there's really really bad. Now, I I think that uh, if we can generate uh, enough practical examples of how building different kinds of institutions, institutions that the way I've been formulating it re recently would be that move from systems where we monetize every resource in nature to one where we do respect for relatives, that that would be a radical shift. If we went from a preoccupation in Anglo-Saxon um, uh, kind of black letter law and even common law notions of, of property and rights, and then how we even, you know, made ourselves seem as holders of these things called rights, that we could move from systems where we, we balanced our respect for individual liberties and rights with something that I've heard elders call, um, uh, you know, inalienable human responsibilities. We have responsibilities as humankind to do certain things. So let's move from a system of resources to a system of relatives, from a system of preoccupied predominantly with rights to one of responsibilities, a, a more counterbalanced view. And then I think we can, we can call out this whole greenwashing and this whole, you know, attempt now to... There, everyone on the planet now is for sustainability. Uh, every oil company, every natural resource, more precise and say who that you really want to sustain. And I think there what we've got to do is formulate sort of a counterpoint 
to progress. So in the place of sustainability, I've been saying, let's just think about how we can create systems of non-anthropocentric life enhancement. What would it mean to live in a way so that we can live so lightly or so well that we are not harming the water, we're not degrading the air, that we're not denuding the soil, that we are encouraging biodiversity, and I would describe those, those are systems of life enhancement. And we can go back in human history and sort of approximate how people live for, for thousands of years in places, again, populations, a key, a key variable here, but who live very well in a sort of more balanced ecosystem kind of model. So where do you think, uh, I mean, I, I could live in that world. That world seems ideal to me, but you know, the, the most popular video and interview that I've given is, is with a billionaire capitalist who's a TV personality whose mantra is, I want to go to sleep richer than I woke up. Um, and he's got a lot of supporters. That seems to be a very, um, a, a very strong oh. drive in this world. Um, what's it going to take to, to, to change that mindset? I mean, like, you know, you're preaching to the converted amongst... No, 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 absolutely. Absolutely. I think what it's going to take is um, to start some very serious discussions. Uh, well, first of all, I, I, let's be honest. There are going to be some people that are not going to be convinced. I mean, if, if you believe... I mean, what we're talking about are different kinds of stories about humanity, the planet, uh, humankind's role on the planet. I mean, I think we better reconcile ourselves to the fact there are probably some people on the planet who think bigger is better, as long as I'm the one who's accumulating more and more, and the people who aren't, you know, they're just quite simply losers. Other than in vote children creating, how you reach those people. I'm just with the tough one. I don't know. From an initial perspective, I think people be any different in existing institutions that they're looking for opportunities to try something different. So I'd say, you know, the best way to win our mind successfully what these different institutions can do and how people can live well and in fact better in those institutions and in the prevailing models that have been offered. So it's really practical demonstrations, I think. So, so in a way, in a way you have to catch, in a way it has to be a money-making venture for these people to buy in. Well, I think it does. Now, and again, I'm, you know, so I just recently uh, started talking to people who are very much into ecosystem services. And, you know, they will tell you that the way to save the planet is to... We've got to do a, 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 an actual economic value to ecosystems, to plants, to, to animals, to these whole complex systems. And then when people will see, quote, what they produce and what it costs to destroy them, that they'll stop doing it. Now, I've got to tell you, at one fundamental level... I'm kind of going like, really? I mean, so, you know, that's, that's, the, that's the embodiment of, no, the opposite of Einstein's thinking. No, we'll fix the problem with... People who are talking about ecosystem service credits, wetland credits those kinds of things, creating those to save or to restore riparian uh, ecosystems and wetlands. At the time being, if, if, if it helps us a little bit, maybe, maybe, you, maybe you employ that. I don't know. I'm, I'm enough of, of, a, of a pragmatist to say, gee, we've, we've got to do something. I, I'm, I, I'm still not so sure that that's going to uh, get us very far. I'm talking to a gentleman now who, who's working in this area, and he says, you know, but we've got one problem. We don't know how to monetize cultural value. Well, we're immediately talking about spiritual value of places, of landscapes, 
and I'm saying, yeah, I think you have a problem there. You know, I'm willing to, to talk to you about that, but I said, you know, it may be this is just an issue of incommensurability. There's no way to monetize a spiritual and in some cases cultural value of something. It doesn't work that way. So is it just a case of bringing down that paradigm? You know what I mean? It seems, it seems like they're all crumbling as it is. The economic paradigm, the political paradigm, the religious paradigm, they all seem to be struggling. Uh, after thousands of years of development, they're, they're turning out to be not the structure that everybody thought they were. That's right. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I, I think, so here's, okay, so now let's, let's be real circumspect about this. Let's be very honest. So you're in Vancouver, right? Yes. So you're in the back a backyard, of, of probably in the, from a scientific perspective. You know, David Suzuki's been one of the most outs, outspoken scientists. Say, what are you guys talking about? Right. This is serious. Um, you you have even you know every once in a while uh, you know uh, people like uh, the Texas uh, oil uh, you get these people who will stand up and say, you have you know, there issues here that we need to address. Now, I think here's where we've got to be very, very honest about what we're up against. I'm willing to put forward the premise that almost every institution you and I move out of, in and out of daily, once we leave our house, is has very sunk cost and investment in a system that is the enemy. And, and so you've got to be very modest in terms of thinking how you are going to change those systems. And I think the, the, the way you change the systems is, I don't think you're going to, you know, go out and tear down the system. Uh, I think the best way to do it for all of the people who are starting to look outside those systems for better models, we have to do some demonstration projects. We have to show, guess what? We can do something better. We can make a livable community where you would want to raise your child, where you would want to have a family, where you don't need to be dependent on an automobile. Uh, th those things aren't aren't th those things aren't fairy tales. That's not romanticism. That's hard work. The question is, do you have really the hard work to to build these to think these through and and sort of take these embodiments of these these principles of respect of resiliency of of relationship, of relatives. Yeah, and just another uh, uh, example, the daunting force against it, like you say, I'm from Vancouver, and Dave Suzuki lives here, and, and Greenpeace started here, and many environmental movements are, are, are very strong here because we have nature in our backyard. We grow up, right. we grow up in, in nature here. But the decisions that are being made are made in cities of 25 million that there's very little of any kind of nature at all. And, and, yes. and there's this separation, obviously, between these people, how they see living compared to how, how for instance, someone that, where I live, where I, I love the fact that there is cougars that come, and bears that still come into the city. Mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's, I embrace that. Um, right. so, how, so, so how do you convince the people that make decisions um, that the, the world that they've created that that separation from from nature is is at the core of their disconnection with with the reality of this planet. Well, I think I think that's you know I think you just put your finger on 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 the biggest issue. I mean, I I think um, that we're going to have to have a lot better organizational skills than, than what we have thus far. And this is going to be a big challenge now, okay? Because, um, you know, I, I, I think in some ways 
in some ways, uh, Occupy was a good example of some of the issues on our side. The people who are our allies, we're going to have to address because it's hard to bring people together when we don't have real viable political models of how we do or do that without them immediately seem, seeming hierarchical and all of that. So that the kind of discussion, serious discussion we need to have about organization, you know, for people who are, are dissatisfied with, you know, the best government money can buy model is what we currently have now to something much more um, uh, really fundamentally democratic is, is I, I don't think the experiments in democracy are by any means very far along. And I, I, so I'm calling on Occupy to say that I think one of the things we need, all of us who are, are like-minded about things aren't working, we're going to need to really start some serious discussions about how we come together, how we work together, and how we can get organized in ways that really have consequence. Because like I, I say, uh, the dominant institutions, um, you, you know, you can study that, you know, how works and and get in there and do certain things but if you want to do something differently that means there's going to be uh we're going to have to invest some time in thinking about how we do that well and uh, so it's it's going to be difficult i i wish i could give you a uh some sort of you know simple um a sloganistic answer, but I don't think there is one. I mean, I think this is going to be very, very hard work for people. So where does real change take place, in your opinion? I mean, you studied so right many now, it, Right now, it takes place in communities, at the community level. I don't think, I see, uh, you know, I, I uh, don't, and so people will say, don't say that, because we need large institutional shifts. I agree. But I think in an odd sort of way, the way we're going to maybe even begin to nudge those larger institutions in a different way is you've got to address change where people live, where they sleep, where they eat, where they take their kids to school, where they buy groceries, where they shop. And I think that happens at community level. So I think, I do think that We've got to be very supportive of community level, local level initiatives as much as we can. Now, I, I know you're familiar with that model because, as I understand, that's a, that, that in large part sort of explains Vancouver to a certain extent. This wasn't from provincial government that, that Vancouver got into. Portland's the same way. These were grassroots, kind of from the community up. I think we've got to promote that as much as we can, and then maybe we generate large enough numbers uh, where we start sending people to national, provincial, state government levels to represent other views. What about the individual? I mean, in a way, you could say that it all starts with the individual, that 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 I cannot be shaped by an outside force because I've done the inner work to see my reality a little cl right. clearly. Um, um, th see, uh, that's what I'm wondering. This, this project kind of explores that. I, I mean, social the social aspect of, of humanity... Hold on a second, I'll be right with you. Sure, I've, no I've, problem. Got, I've, got, I've got a call here. I've got sure. Yeah, yeah, go for it. It's it's my significant other, my wife, and oh. I think she's saying you you got to go pick up our grandson here oh, soon. Dang. So let me let me let me get this call here. Sure, sure. Yeah, it looks like we we may have to pick this discussion up at another place. But go frame your question because if I don't have time to go into it now, we'll pick up with this question because you were talking about the individual. Yeah, yeah, the individual journey. Because I mean, it seems that 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 indigenous culture is also very much into the 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 individual journey, um, mm -hmm. and and it seems to me that that the paradox of a working society is that every individual has to pull his weight and has to be aware. So mm -hmm. I would like to get into that with you, into consciousness and, and ego and the indigenous perspective of ego in your 
culture because obviously in Western culture ego has created a world of dissonance and conflict. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, I I think again, you know, this is this is to me and this to me is the kind of height of of sort of again why we need really to have some serious discussions with with you know indigenous wisdom keepers, knowledge holders, because I I think in some ways the you know this this dichotomy between the individual and the com community and or society, um, individual versus collectivism, that is is very much a, a Western a very Western notion. Um, I think the way to formulate individualism and to bring these issues together, whether we're talking in an economic sense, a political sense, even even in a spiritual sense, in a in a way, is that it seems to me that that within many indigenous traditions, um, that unique individual you are, uh, in some ways, is um enabled, empowered, uh, shaped, influenced, encouraged by these relationships that you're involved in. And and we know there's no greater myth than this, you know, you know, man is a, is, is an island, that he's a you know, this self there is no such thing as a self made man, okay? Um, yeah, they had a lot of relationships. They even if they wheeled and dealed, they were making deals. They were working with others. Uh, I think that's that's the challenge is is to encourage people to understand that you know individualism isn't this notion of sort of creating your your moral autonomy or set of aesthetic values or spiritual expression as if it's unto you. It is not unto you, it is of you and you are of this world. If you weren't, you would live not for a minute. These relationships, these processes, were bound up in. So making that kind of that kind of connection is crucial. You know what I'm really curious about indigenous cultures is, is that how they understood ego. I mean, Western culture uh, spiritualism mm -hmm. understands us as being a kind of a conflicted being in regards to having an ego and then a, a, another self. Um, does indigenous culture also understand that we have a duality of 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 conflicting? Drives. Well, that now that we have to go pretty deep in into psychology and environment to, to kind of talk about that. Let's pick up that on okay. the next call. I, I'm going to have to go. Okay, I've, I've yes. got to run an errand. Um, shoot me an email. Okay, and let's pick this discussion up here, maybe in a couple of days. Okay, be more but I want to think about that question. That's a good question, and I, I don't want to try to give you a glib, fast answer. Okay, because you know, I, I really, I, the biggest influence in my life was was a, a, a fellow named Carlos Castaneda, who spoke of a Yaqui Indian shaman, and, and their their philosophy was the biggest influence on my life. And I would love to get an indigenous perspective on some of these things that Western culture takes for granted as being part of our nature. Good. Okay, so I will, you got it. I'll, I'll talk to you soon. We'll continue continue the conversation. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. Bye bye.